I'm Kunal Sen, the director of any wider, and welcome to the wider webinar, Paving the Way for Fiscal Capacity, which is part of the, of the Think Wider webinar series, New Perspectives on Domestic Revenue Mobilization. This webinar series is targeted to researchers, policymakers, and practitioners on, sh on sharing our insights on domestic resource mobilization, where we have a very large program in UNU wider. And in fact, this particular webinar is part of, of one particular project fiscal states, its origins and their implications. And we could hear a little bit about the findings from that project uh, in, in a few minutes uh, or from one of the panelists. So the question really that we try to answer in this webinar is the question of how does it, how do we actually see over time in developing countries, the transformation of public finance institutions and the emergence of fiscal states? Because we know that's really important for becoming an effective state and state building. Now, surprisingly, we know very little about developing countries and how that might happen in the context of Africa and Asia and Latin America. While we know quite a bit about the emergence of fiscal states in Western Europe and, and the US and so on, and the richer countries. So we're trying to try to understand well, how does it happen? How does history matter? How do institutions matter? How does politics matter in the emergence of fiscal states? And what are the policy implications from what we have so far known, limited knowledge we have, on the emergence of fiscal states in developing countries. So what we're gonna do and try and do in this one webinar, we're gonna share some insights on what we know about the origins of fiscal states in developing countries and their policy implications. And to do that, we have an excellent set of panelists. I'm gonna now introduce them uh, one by one. First, we have Antonio Sauba, who's a reader in developing economics at the University of Manchester's Global Development Institute and a uni wider non-resident senior research fellow. Antonio co-leads the project on fiscal states along with me as part of the uni Widers program of research on domestic resource mobilization. Antonio's research has looked at determinants of governance, institutional performance, and how they impeach on development outcomes and policies. We are also very fortunate to have Shanta Devarajan, who's a professor of practice of international development at Georgetown University's Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service. Shanta has previously worked at the World Bank where he was a senior director for development economics, the chief economist of the Middle East and North Africa, Africa and South, Indi South Asia regions, and also the Human Development Network. Welcome, Shanta, to this, to this webinar. We also have Sansha Blackmore. Sansha is a senior lecturer at the African Tax Institute, probably one of the leading institutes of tax and development in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Her work focuses on development and poverty, institutional economics, and also Shanta Sansia takes a multidisciplinary understanding of state society relations. We also have Anne Mete Kair, who is a professor of the Department of Political Science at Aarhus University. Anne Mete Kair does research in the areas of governance and political economy. She's recently authored a wider working paper, Fiscal States of Southern Africa, Conceptualization and Empirical Trends. And she will speak a bit about this paper uh, in her own, her own opening remarks. So what I want to now do is I want to ask each of the panelists a couple of questions. One is a question at the beginning to start with, and then perhaps when you have time, also a following a follow up question, the Q&A. So I'm gonna ask Antio actually to talk a little bit about the Fiscal States Project. What is the background motivation for this project? What have you learned about this very important question, how to build fiscal states in developing countries, and what can we take from this, from this literature and the, the knowledge we have in terms of policy implications for the future. So perhaps first, Antonio, over to you, and then I will ask Shanta, Sansi, and Mete questions to follow up later on. Antonio, if you don't mind, can you speak for 10 minutes? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gunal, for your kind uh, introduction. Now, uh, uh, let me share the screen. And um, I have a few slides for us today. I want to take uh, 10 minutes to uh, discuss a little bit in more detail what kind of um, research we have done on, on, um, on uh, fiscal states and uh, why it matters, uh, have you said. So this is, um, this is on our, uh, on the UN wider website. That, that's the, the page of the, the project. And uh, what we have done, uh, together with a, a group of a multidisciplinary group of economists, political scientists, uh, academics of development studies. We have looked at uh, the role of uh, 
states. And in particular, taxation. Often, as a, our papers, papers we have written have been on taxation. So the starting point for this is that modern states are complex machines. They perform a range of functions which is far greater than what we used to have only 100 years ago. But the question is, how do we finance that? And that's what we were trying to understand, as Kunalo was also reminding us. Uh, how, do, how do states finance their activities? This is uh, an academic question, sure, but not only. It's, only, it's also policy relevant. Uh, SDG 17.1 is on uh, mobilizing domestic revenues. And the uh, SDGs apart, you know, setting this as, a, as a, a policy goal, we also live an age where uh, other forms of finance, such as aid, are uh, flat, have been flat for the last few years. So it's a, a timely question, understanding how states finance their activities. Consider, in our case, to see the relevance of this, consider taxation. How do, uh, how do different countries around the world uh, uh, do uh, a few facts. You know, look at the, at the these two graphs here. They tell us that uh, in general, high-income economies are also those that are more fiscally developed, and often, often they collect a, a share of uh, total revenues over GDP that is uh, double compared to low-income economies. So that's the kind of uh, gap that uh, you see, and it tells you why it's important to learn how to tax. Uh, the other thing that uh, you will notice looking at, uh, you know, the particular the left-hand side graph uh, is that the gap in uh, tax revenues over GDP is, uh, over time is essentially constant. It doesn't tend to reduce. And this tells us that perhaps there are structural conditions that explain why you see this gap between countries that have learned how to tax very well and others that are on the way to do so. When you look on the right hand side at the regional disaggregation, you see that, uh, yes, largely the, the facts there you know, are consistent with what we see on the left hand side graph that the richer regions of the world tend to collect more revenues. But there is also something interesting happening in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Sub-Saharan Africa doesn't do too bad, actually. It collects more or less the same amount of revenues as uh, richer South Asia, and uh, is not too far away from much richer uh, Latin America. So uh, this is uh, the, the bigger picture. Why is this uh, important? For at least uh, three reasons. So learning how to tax, so uh, becoming fiscally developed gives you access to uh, uh, more sophisticated instruments for taxation and spending. You have, a, you, you have a better chance of implementing programs that can uh, reduce uh, property. So a progressive tax system, sophisticated forms of taxation like income tax, they also give you a much greater opportunity to reduce poverty. Uh, apart from that, uh, forms that states that uh, have learned how to tax are also states that tend to spend a lot more on health and education. And this is uh, one of uh, one of the graphs that we have uh, we have in our in, in our paper that Kunal and I have written on this. And uh, you see that richer regions of the world are also those that spend a lot uh, more. Uh, on education in this case. Uh, the other, the third reason why this is important is that uh, learning how to tax is also transformative in another sense. It, it, we say it brings a governance dividend. Once uh, you start paying taxes, you tend to make your government more accountable. But when you actually see this in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of uh, what happened to accountability in low-income countries, we see that uh, the lack, not learning how to tax has left this gap in terms of uh, voice and accountability with uh, richer countries uh, essentially constant over time. Uh, what do we do about this? We've done eight papers. We have written eight papers and uh, we have produced uh, a special issue in the Journal of Institutional Economics. This is open access. We believe in making research 
accessible to everyone. And it's uh, we have used a variety of methodologies from standard quantitative econometric work to case studies and more. What we find, and it's difficult to do justice to, uh, to the whole special issue, what we find is that the three factors essentially contribute to developing taxation and developing fiscal institutions in the long term. Political determinants, understanding the politics of taxation, how you build a contract between a fiscal contract between states and uh, citizens. And in this, uh, having uh, a system of constraints on the executive power can be important. We have also learned that the institutions matter in this. Uh, um, the ability to develop at the same time a property rights system, for example, that in itself can contribute to raise tax base is important. We've also learned that history matters. Historical conditions sometimes going to back to pre-colonial times shape uh, taxation and taxation norms to these days. Uh, this is uh, the academic part, but uh, are there any policy lessons for, uh, coming from this? I'll give you four in the three minutes I have, uh, I have left, so I make sure I finish uh, on time and then I'll be happy to elaborate more if there are any questions from uh, the audience. But uh, essentially this research uh, reminds us, uh, and the first message is that uh, Rome wasn't built in a day, if we may say so. So we have to be aware, that donors and policymakers have to be aware that the learning how to tax and building fiscal states, transforming public finance institutions in general, it's a long-term process. So what this means is that uh, in a way you've got to be patient, stay the course, and at the same time acknowledge that the financing state activities has to go alongside with the other forms of finance, loans, aid as well, resource, natural resource, revenues coming from natural resources. And at the same time, while you finance state activities with more traditional forms of finance, you develop the taxation. The second message we have is that uh, history matters, as I was saying before. What this matters, uh, matters uh, the policy message here is that uh, it gives a, a, a recognizing the role of history, makes us understand why public finance reforms work or do not work in some context. So we have to be aware of that while uh, designing uh, reforms. Three, politics matters. Um, it, th in this case, uh, our research tells us the policy lesson on this is that uh, uh, understanding the politics of taxation is uh, as important as uh, the focus on technocratic solutions. Often in, uh, in uh, public finance research, we see for good reasons, focus on uh, more short-term solutions, day-to-day -day taxation and new IT solutions, new ways to communicate with taxpayers. That's absolutely correct and it's all fine. But understanding also why citizens pay taxes and what kind of institutions can facilitate that, like institutions that keep the ruler accountable. This helps us to build a fiscal contract to, between states and citizens, and it fosters the conditions for a taxation to emerge. And the fourth and final message um, on this is that uh, we also find that the complementarities uh, matter. You don't look at taxation in isolation. You may need at the same time other types of institutions to develop them at the same time, like a property rights system that can increase the tax base or develop the statistical capacity of states, the ability to gather information at the same time. So complementarities matter. And uh, I think I've exhausted my 10 minutes. As promised, I'll stop uh, here and I look forward to receiving questions. Uh, thank you very much, Antonio. Actually, I'm still on time. I should have mentioned in my opening remarks that we're going to try and keep about 30 minutes or so for Q&A. So I'm really looking, really looking forward to getting questions from the audience. We have a very large audience here, online audience. And so certainly we'll try to make sure that we have some questions, we get some questions from the audience and then have responses. So now I'm going to move on to Shanta Devarajan. Shanta, this uh, what Antonio presented leads very nicely to the question I was going to ask you, which is that 
we saw that uh, among the regions in the, in the developing world, Sub-Saharan Africa doesn't do, do too badly, but we also noticed in the graph that, that Antonio presented that tax of GDP has stabilized, has not really improved for the last 10, 15 years. So in other words, though, there's been a bit of a catch up in Sub-Saharan Africa on tax of GDP. We really haven't seen much improvement in the last 10, 15 years in a period when we had reasonably good economic growth, at least till the pandemic. So that kind of leads me to this question, which is very relevant, and I know Shanti has uh, done so much work on this, that, so what kind of policy interventions can make a difference? If we wanted to enhance fiscal capacity in Sub-Saharan Africa, not just the short-term solutions, perhaps as Antonio talked about, which is to try and reform tax systems and trink up uh, tax reforms, but the more longer-term solutions, the longer-term kind of uh, things that we can try and do um, in, in the continent. So I'm very keen to hear, we're very keen to hear your views on this, and if you don't mind, within seven minutes. Thank you. You have to unmute yourself, Shanta. We can't hear you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and also a pleasure to follow from Antonio's very nice uh, introduction because it, many of the themes that he uh, mentioned are going to be echoed in what I have to say. Um, I think you're right to focus on Sub-Saharan Africa because there are two things that distinguish Sub-Saharan Africa from many other regions in the world. One is that it has a large number of resource-rich countries, you know, countries like Nigeria or Angola or Gabon, Equatorial Guinea. Uh, and the second is that there are many countries in Africa that receive large amounts of foreign aid. And I think both of these actually have an effect on the the continent's ability to raise taxes. Let's take natural resources for, uh, first. See, the, the, the difference between natural resource revenues and taxes is that the resource revenues go directly from, say, the oil company to the government without passing through the hands of the citizens. So that gives the government a lot more discretion in how to spend it. And we've seen the effects of that, which is that these resource-rich countries do a horrible job of uh, spending uh, oil revenues it, to the benefit of the people. I mean, we see countries like Gabon and Equatorial Guinea, which are high income or upper middle income countries that have rates of poverty that are 30 to 40%. This is, this is uh, unjustifiable, uh, except that basically it's prima facie evidence that the government is not being accountable to the people. Now, the problem is made worse as a result of this, because if the government is not doing a good job in spending its oil revenues, then the people are reluctant to pay taxes because it won't do any good. This is what we call tax morale. Um, so we're in this situation, it's, it's, a, it's a low level equilibrium where governments don't want to raise taxes because they, they don't want to be held accountable and citizens don't want to pay taxes because they don't think government will actually uh, uh, do anything with them. And that's why it's so difficult to get the tax to revenue GDP, tax, uh, tax to GDP rate, uh, uh, ratio up in countries in Africa, uh, uh, because you can't do that with incremental tax reform, these sort of short-term measures that uh, Antonio was talking about. You need a really a radical change in the system. And let me say that the thing I've been proposing for a long time now, is that instead of the government actually spending the oil revenues, they should actually transfer it as cash transfers to the citizens, equal amounts, and then tax them. So even though this is simply giving with one hand and taking with the other, it fundamentally shifts the accountability mechanism. And the usual question that is asked is why, why would a government do that? Uh, uh, but I would add that in my most recent paper, which is uh, the one I presented at the GDN uh, network, uh, what I show is that there might be political reasons why governments would, would want to do that, especially if they have high expenditures coming up for which they actually need tax revenue. So they're gonna need to get citizens to pay taxes. Then let me turn to the second part, which is foreign aid. And this is a bit more controversial, but there is a classic paper by P.T. Bauer uh, uh, back in the 1950s, I think, that says, when will developing countries learn how to tax? And that was a paper about foreign aid. And foreign aid actually doesn't raise incentives for governments to, 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 to levy taxes. 
Now, the, I, I, I think we are seeing this play out in Africa, in, in sub-Saharan Africa. And the example I always like to use is Kenya, because Kenya, as, as you may know, has the highest tax to GDP ratio in Africa. How did that happen? Well, back in 1992, the donors collectively decided they were gonna cut off aid to Kenya because of the high levels of corruption. And when that happened, they actually, then that happened, Kenya lost uh, all this aid money, they raised taxes and they got their tax to GDP ratio up to about 22% of GDP. So it, it, that to me is prima facie evidence how tax, how aid actually takes away from incentives to raise taxes. Now, what can we do about that? Well, uh, coming from building on the, the, the suggestion on, on resource revenues, why not consider distributing aid resources as cash transfers to citizens and then have the governments tax them if they need money for public goods? This is again, a way of making, uh, making uh, enabling citizens to hold their governments accountable. And I think that's the key for all of these, but it's not going to happen with incremental changes because as I said in the beginning, these are low level equilibrium, equilibria that we cannot uh, break by tinkering at the margin. Thanks, I think that's all. Thanks, Shant, that is really important, the points that you made both about uh, cash transfers, the way to increase tax morale, which is kind of very, uh, very unusual way of looking at it, but I can see the argument there. Um, because you're giving one, at one hand by trying to also uh, take in revenue and the other. The other point about foreign aid and the distortion effect it might have, and I do think that you know, there's also an argument and, uh, on, on conflict affected states and how that might also work out in those kind of regimes too. Yes. So we can, we can come back to that. I know you need to leave for a lecture very soon, but we'll come back to that in, in the overall discussion later on. Uh, let me now move to Sansia Blackburn. And Sansia, this is again, very nice way springboard from what Shanta said to your, what I wanted to ask you because Shanta talked about the region as a whole, Sub-Saharan Africa, but now we want to zoom into one particular country, the country South Africa. And the reason we're going to zoom in on South Africa is because South Africa has also done pretty well on tax over GDP ratios. It's again, one of the higher uh, ratios in, in, the, in the African continent. And uh, yet we seem to be seeing a situation where the fiscal or the social contract is unraveling in South Africa. Why is that? And what can that tell us a little bit about other uh, countries in the region well, who have haven't yet had the kind of tax capacity that South Africa has had. So Sansi, over to you. Thank you very much, Kuno. I'm also going to just try and share a few um, slides with you. So thank you, thank you very much for, for the question. Um, so South Africa is, is of course an interesting and perhaps an unusual case in the sub-Saharan context in the sense that, of course, we are fiscally a well-capacitated um, constitutional democracy, yet our fiscal capacity does not translate into development outcomes. So I would like to respond to, to your question within a framework that was proposed by, by uh, Professor Wilson Pritchard um, from Sussex University, suggesting that the state's reliance on taxation may offer taxpayers a handle to demand, demand accountability. Now, as a brief background, I'm, I'm sure most people know this, but South Africa, of course, democratized in 1994, introducing the, the age of Madiba, but also a complete redesign of our fiscal contract. So inclusion of the, of the erstwhile excluded majority was, was, of course, priority. And there was broad buy-in into a massive tax and transfer project to fund the social wage, um, and which of course we knew would also require a balancing act to also at the same time maintain our tax base. If I can just move on. So we of course know that um, some valuable democratic gains were made, but from 2009 onwards, basically with the introduction of the Zuma administration, uh, those gains were mostly reversed, and unfortunately, that also introduced the, the era of, of state capture. Now, there are many complex facets to the state capture scenario, and if one has to single out a central contributor, it would have to be the role of our state-owned enterprises. So before, the state-owned enterprises were 
instrumental in our progress through the construction of essential uh, infrastructure, but they have now become the main vehicles for large scale leakage of our public funds. And we remain unable to plug these leakages through the conventional checking mechanisms for a variety of reasons that would take a bit too long to, to discuss here. So let me interrupt you very quickly. Um, are you sharing slides? And I've got some several questions being asked about whether you're sharing. I don't think you need the slides, but just in case. Um, I, I am sharing. I was under the impression that they are actually being shared. Let me try again. Sorry, Kunal. Do I don't necessarily think that you need the slides because you're, you're very clear in what you are saying. Right. Let me try and share them again. Apologies about that. Yeah, Are we sharing now? Slides. Yes, we can. Hundred percent. Right. Thank you so much for for alerting me to that. So, okay. So, um, I think. Well, I've I've mentioned that our state-owned enterprises are quite instrumental, or or have become the main vehicle for for the the state capture and the leakage of public funds that we've been unable to to plug so far, and um, of course. Key among these failures of our state-owned enterprises, of course, would be our state monopoly um, electricity supplier. So life in South Africa has become extremely difficult with daily long hours of electricity outages, which of course also shuts down the water supply, which, which is supplied through electric pumps and um, connectivity and so on. And businesses, especially small businesses are failing rapidly it's just cost us about 2% of economic growth. And we are now facing a recession, having registered negative growth for the last quarter. And this, of course, comes on the back of the very tough COVID years that we've had. So there are now talks of a failed state and even a mafia state. So the question is given that taxpayers' money is used to facilitate the state capture project, do taxpayers perhaps have a role or a mechanism to demand accountability from a government that have successfully eluded accountability in its vertical and its horizontal forms. All right, so I'm going to just give you a few of the statistics that we would need to explore this question. So firstly, as a bit of background, our population is just over 60 million and 34 million, so it's just over half, 55 and a half percent, according to World Bank estimations, um, of the 60 million are, are poor. Approximately 27 million of our population have to survive off state grants. Fewer than 16 million are employed. So our unemployment number is at 33 percent or 43 if we include the discouraged work seekers. And as I've mentioned, we're now in negative growth territory. Um, possibly heading for a um, recession. And then some tax info. So our tax to GDP ratio would suggest high fiscal capacity. So we are between 25 and 29% over the past few years for our tax to GDP ratio. And our tax constitutes 98% of total government revenue. So we do meet Wilson Pritchard's requirement that the state is heavily reliant on, on tax revenue. Then looking at our personal income tax, 36 to 39% of all tax revenue, but that's raised of 5.5 million individuals that are assessed. Of the 5.5 million, fewer than 1 million. So I'm talking about 980,450 individuals pay 73% of the PIT. So that translates to 26% of all tax revenue. And one can compare this just to get an idea of scale with the contribution of our broad-based VAT system, which is which comes in at 25% of, of tax revenue. And I guess one should also then compare the 5.5 million assessed and the 980,000 individuals that contribute to, to PIT with the fact that 27 million of our population are actually grant recipients. Looking at our company income tax, 20.7% of tax revenue um, comes from our CIT. It used to be higher, but it has declined on the back of the decline of profitability of our um, business sector. 
And of, of our companies that pay or that contribute to CIT, 770 companies pay 62% of CIT, and that translates into 13% of all tax revenues. So if one adds the, um, the 770 companies with the 980,000 individuals, one arrives at a number of nearly 40%, 39% to be precise, of all of our tax revenue we get from fewer than 1 million individuals and fewer than 1,000 companies. So we are dealing with a very narrow concentrated tax base. Just after our recent um, budget that was read in February, one of the analysts actually remarked that we are fast running out of taxpayers. So these numbers, of course, are quite an indictment on the 1994 undertaking to pursue inclusivity for the majority of our population. The majority actually remain poor, unemployed, and dependent on very small welfare grants. Now, in this context, one should also remember that the information regarding state capture, including the fact that the perpetrators remain unpunished, now this knowledge is in the public domain. There was an official commission and the report has been published. So knowledge of the billions that it continues to cost us, along with the lived experience of the long daily power outages, means that, of course, tax morale is really low. So as a result, coercive tax enforcement rules, like, for instance, a six, a Section 62 of our Tax Administration Act, which allows warrantless search and seizure. Now, this raises questions, of course, about um, constitutionality, but those are the kinds of measures, really draconian measures that we have to rely on to, to collect our taxes. So currently, there is not much scope to demand accountability to the quid pro quo nature of the fiscal contract. And the notion of tax bargaining is also not readily entertained. It is viewed as a tax revolt by the wealthy who are resisting their tax and transfer obligations rather than a challenge to the ongoing unaccountability of, of government. And this, of course, is understandable, these fears, given our history and, of course, the persisting extreme inequality. So there are fears that the social transformation agenda may be hijacked by a few wealthy taxpayers. It is, however, also true that there's a negative incentive for a state wishing to remain unaccountable to engage in tax bargaining. So it would serve the purpose of an unaccountable state where tax bargaining may in fact be most useful to taxpayers to rather resort to draconian enforcement. Now there is quite an asymmetry between the bargaining going on on the expenditure side and the pressures and leakages on the expenditure side, but I I think in the interest of time, Kunal, I will cut my story short here and perhaps address those if there are any questions that, that arise from that. Thank you, Sansi. Actually, again, I mean, what's really interesting here is how structural conditions matter in understanding what's happening in South Africa. Obviously, when you have high unemployment, low economic growth, at least a situation where you have a very narrow tax base, as you mentioned, about both personal and corporate income tax. And of course, how politics comes into the picture on around the state capture period. So these are exactly telling us, that even though South Africa, at the initial period after 1994, uh, brought in very important uh, tax and, and transfer regimes to finance the social wage, as you mentioned, there is a also how important it is also think about structural conditions. If those are not uh, addressed, then you have a situation, as you've seen right now in South Africa, a very, very narrow tax base. And of course, problems of state uh, enterprises and how that might also play out in the future. So it's a very important to think about, and we'll come back to these issues in the Q&A. Thank you, Sansia. Let's now move on to Meta. And Meta, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, uh, we also, I mean, this goes back now, back again to the region. So we went from Shanta's uh, discussing Sub-Saharan Africa to South Africa, now back to the region once again of, of uh, South uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, the questions I want to ask you are first, what are the preconditions of a fiscal state? We, we talked about the fiscal state being very important. And Antonio made the point that this is very really important in many different ways, not only for providing public goods, but also for governance, uh, the governance dividend. Um, so first, what are the preconditions of a fiscal state? And of course, linked to that, then of course, the question about the region. Are all Sub-Saharan Af uh, African uh, states or countries fiscal states? If not, why not? But over to you. Thank you, Saj. 
Uh, thank you so much, Kunal, and also for the invitation to take part in the special issue and in this uh, this webinar. Um, can everyone, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. That's good. At some point, I will have two slides to share, and uh, but I'll stick to my seven minutes, I think. But of course, obviously, me and my co-authors, who are Matilda Jeppesen and, and Anne Caroline Back, uh, we found these questions extremely relevant. Um, uh, for at least two reasons, um, and I'm going to turn them around. So I'm going to talk about the the last question first, so to speak, if that's OK. Um, but the two reasons are, I mean, firstly, um, as was said, there's an increased focus on on, on uh, increasing, you know, domestic revenue mobilization uh, in the de uh, international development community. And that focus seems to come with an assumption that all African states are fiscal states, or at least that they have the possibility or the potential to become one if their fiscal capacity is enhanced. So programs to support taxation are typically formulated based on, you could say, an implicit assumption that the prerequisite or preconditions, as you call it in your question, for building or in advancing fiscal states that, that they exist in, in, in low-income countries in, in, and, and in sub-Saharan Africa. Yet you can you can argue that if such assumptions are mistakenly made, um, effective tax policy implementation and fruitful yields are very unlikely, regardless of any political will to tax more or will to learn how to tax, if you will. So, um, so, and I guess that relates also to your introductory observation about uh, the the revenue take not having changed much during the last fifteen years. So recognizing the absence or presence of fiscal states is definitely a first step towards explaining why significant efforts, um, reform efforts to, tax, to improve the tax system, for example, implementation of VAT, has not really substantially increased uh, tax revenue in many African countries lately. And of course, this has been observed by scholars such as Fjellstad and Mick Moore and Fossett and Bua uh, and so on. Um, Okay, so the other reason why it's it's such a relevant question or two relevant questions is that um, the literature does not really offer sufficient help in recognizing fiscal states, we argue, simply because there's a lack of, of clear conceptualization. So this is where we begin. So actually our piece is very much a conceptual one. Um, uh, the term fiscal state used to be a prerogative of industrialized nation states but within the past two decades, this has changed. And mentions of the fiscal state in scholarly work um, have increased across disciplines. So the term is now applied in works uh, on state building globally. And here, proper conceptualization is key. So we arguably need a fresh look at the concept of fiscal states to avoid conflating cause and concept and effect. And if for the because if we, have, if we have not clearly defined the fiscal state, how can we recognize it when we see it or be certain that we are able to separate its, uh, separate its uh, potential preconditions from its defining attributes? All right. Um, or for that matter, uh, to, from its, uh, its effects as well. So to explore how understandings of the fiscal state differ, uh, across fields and empirical contexts, we carried out this systematic literature re review in our uh, article uh, in the special issue. Um, and, and we examined the diverse understandings and applications of this concept um, with a view to kind of settling on a, on a, on a simple and concise definition. And let me, let me just try to share here. Um, can you see it? Uh, yeah, we can hear us. You can probably um, use slideshow, maybe that will make it uh, more visible. Yes, uh, let's see if I can find the slideshow. Is this it? I think so. Yes. Yeah, um, so, um, in reviewing the literature, we found that most definitions of the fiscal state they have uh, not so much in common, but they do um, all, most of them apply Schumpeter's simple understanding of the tax state as reliance mainly on income from taxes. And then they add the element of borrowing 
But beyond this common ground, understandings of the concept um, vary in terms of intention, as we indicate here in the figure. Um, and intention refers to a concept's defining attributes, but also its extension, so uh, the empirical cases to which a concept applies. So are all Af uh, Sub-Saharan African states, fiscal states, for instance. So to accommodate the challenges that we identify in the literature review, um, we find that a parsimonious definition should have like should live up to three features. First of all, the concept should not include the size and composition of public expenditure, because it would kind of not separate it probably enough, enough from its uh, effects. So public expenditure can itself be explained by the nature of the fiscal state. Second, it should be clearly distinguishable from uh, other effects such as welfare, governance, and inequality. Um, and thirdly, it should be distinguishable from its preconditions, such as, for instance, uh, the level of commercialization of the economy. So drawing on McMore's work and also Bunny's uh, work, more historical work, we offer a definition which we believe lives up to these um, requirements, so which are uh, that we define the fiscal state as a state whose public revenue base is dominated by tax revenue and loans, and where the relationship between taxation and external and domestic borrowing is balanced and thereby sustainable and characterized by interdependence. Okay. Some contributions in the literature reviewed would say that all modern states are fiscal states simply because they have the ability to raise revenue. But our definition implies that not all sub-Saharan African states are fiscal states. Many do not live up to the criteria of tax dominance. For instance, in, in rentier states, as Shanta uh, Dirayawan's uh, um, point was also that they're, you know, in states depending on natural resource rents or foreign aid, um, the revenue base may not be dominated by tax, but by rents from extractive industries. Or um, states may not live up to the criteria of a balance between taxation and loans in debt states, which is a different type of state than a fiscal state altogether. Um, that, that loans are dominant and not taxes. Uh, and in others, again, the balance may not be sustainable. So we try to indicate it in this uh, typology here, um, that there are different kinds of states and the mere fact that there are different types, uh, and these are of course ideal types, will be an answer, uh, will lead to an answer that no, not all Afri states or indeed states in Sub-Saharan African states are fiscal states. All right, I'll end the slide. Yeah. yeah, we could just keep it at the typology because I don't think we'd see, see it. The last slide, I think. But... You didn't see it? No, it couldn't. Um... That's very strange because it's a... Uh... can see it now. Well, anyways, you can look at the article, uh, but we have a, a typology that kind of goes on the level of taxation, balanced with the level of borrowing, and then we place tax states, rentier states, fiscal states, and debt states in it. Um, right. So the answer to the first question, are all states, uh, fiscal states would then be no. And very briefly in the end here, and this is because we argue that directly related to your second question or first question on the preconditions, they often do not exist. So most contributions would highlight a diversified economy and agricultural transformation as preconditions. Um, for example, in his 2013 piece, he argues that, and I quote, the emergence of a modern fiscal state is dependent on the level of commercial development in the economy, for which reason the modern fiscal state is unlikely to appear in an agrarian economy. The lack of agricultural transformation is an important precondition, but one that is often not discussed other than in very generic terms, we believe, such as the need to tax the informal sector or to improve agricultural taxation. And I think we need to be reminded what David Booth wrote in an in a excellent recent working paper. We need to be reminded that the lack of real rural transformation in Africa is important, not just for economic reasons, uh, to do with jobs and the youth bulge, 
It is also a problem from the point of view of the chances of consolidating effective liberal and democratic states. And to that you could add fiscal states. Um, so the fact that many sub-Saharan African states are not fiscal states can to a large extent be explained by the absence of economic preconditions. Taxing more requires first and foremost a taxable surplus, and this requires economic transformation and diversification. Without such a tax base, loans are acquired on other and more vulnerable foundations. So in a way, that was your answer to the first question on preconditions. Um, and we think that this conclusion has important implications for subsequent policy recommendations, which tend to focus overwhelmingly on, on, on merely increasing domestic taxation. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Amit. Again, I think the point you're making is very, uh, very uh, closely linked to what we heard from Antonia and also Shanta and Sansia that ultimately we have to think about the precondition and the economic, the, the, the more deeper factors, if you wish, the deep uh, fundamental determinants of fiscal capacity. And, and, and sometimes one worries that the focus just reforming tax systems, as we often see uh, from donors, may not be the best to think about how a fiscal state will be created. We'll come back to that again later on. I can see there's some questions. I think there's one question for Antonio here. Uh, Antonio, if you, I don't know if you can see the question uh, that's uh, come uh, for you from Paulo Di Renzio. Um, he wants to know, he, she wants to know what the policy implications are. And let me see if I can be more clear about exactly. Um, so yeah, the question really is, uh, you, you mentioned about roaming not being built in a day, talked about political uh, politics and so on. Um, but it seems that some are more significant than others from what you said. And from, so what can you, what kind of policy advice can you give among the factors you mentioned, which are very specific, particularly in low income countries that are relevant for policy for policymakers? What would you pick out as the most important factor? Okay. Um, thank you. Uh... Paolo, it's um, uh, Paolo De Renzio who asked the question, and thank you, Kunal, for for uh, you know uh, putting the question to to me and uh, uh, in a way rephrasing it so so that has even more uh, pregnancy. It, it's uh, complex. The, the answer is is not uh, is not a straightforward one, and uh, intellectual honesty also suggests that. Uh, we don't, you know, make too much uh, of our uh, of our claims, and in particular of uh, lessons two and four that uh, history matters and uh, complementarities uh, matter. So let me say this at the start. But uh, nonetheless, uh, Paolo has asked a, a very good question. Uh, the way I interpret this, uh, if I may, is uh, we talked about uh, historical conditions that uh, may facilitate or not building a tax, a tax system and a fiscal state in general. And uh, we talked about complementarities, but uh, what is the sequence there? So the, the, the question really boils down to what kind of sequence in policy terms you should take when you, when you imagine steps. Um, we don't go that, uh, that far. So we haven't got in, what, uh, in our research uh, a clear sequencing. But uh, we do see that uh, by acknowledging that uh, Rome wasn't built in a day and that the history matters, we see that as at least as a first step to understand that uh, reforms in, in certain contexts are uh, more likely to succeed than others. So that, that's something that when it comes to institutional design, if you are a, a donor or a policymaker in general, is something that you can keep into account. When, for example, you assess risks and opportunities of a, of a certain reform that you may want to uh, undertake. Um, um, uh, going to what we have actually done, what Marie Mali and Otega Fajelstad have done, when you think about the, our paper in the special issue on Uganda, uh, different regions of the country have different norms of tax compliance. Why? It goes back to pre-colonial times and this uh, still matters today. So uh, th this is perhaps an, an example that uh, I can bring uh, on this. On complementarities, and I don't want to go on uh, for uh, too long, 
On complementarities, something that we see is that we don't see some complementarities that uh, matters more than other, but we do see that, uh, uh, like uh, Marina Nistoskaya and uh, um, Michelle Darcy in their paper of special issue argue, you at the same time need to develop some legal capacity as well as fiscal capacity. So having a tax system, uh, sorry, having a property rights system that uh, can expand the tax base can at the same time give you facilitate uh, the, the development of a, a tax system. Uh, and similarly, we find in the Latin American context, in particular Argentina and Chile, case studies by Hillel Soifer, Matthias Omhau, and Jose Perez Cagia, we find that information capacity there matters. So the ability of Latin American states to gather information, to collect revenues. So if at the same time you, you have that, you are in a, in a better position. Which of these complementarities matters more we don't know. We don't know yet. But I guess uh, Paolo's question is telling us to do more research on this. If I, if I can uh, if I can think about the next steps for uh, our project, I hope this gives an answer. And I'll stop here because I don't want to go on for too long. Uh, Andrew, thank you so much. You know, we've got two more questions. And Mehdi, do you want to come in too on the policy implications? Uh, um, uh, just a just a brief comment. So, uh, well, I think it's also important to take seriously that, I mean, there may be a reason. Uh, someone said, well, African, well, for you and Sonia, African, Sub Saharan African states aren't really doing that badly. I mean, it, it has raised and then it, it has stagnated, but maybe that's because they're at the optimum given the structural preconditions. And then I think a policy, an important policy recommendation would be that there might be certain kinds of taxes that it would be better to abstain from in the short run, because it could also lead to uh, obsessive registration, as Mick Moore has recently argued, or it could lead to, you know, excessive coercion, uh, which is not really, you know, promoting a good fiscal contract. Um, if there's time, I would very much like to ask Sancia that whether, you know, you think that the South Africa has gone from being a fiscal state to maybe changing towards you know increasing in debt debtedness or that it you know that it's becoming a different kind of state that you may not lo no longer be called a fiscal state i don't know it was just a thought that i got when i heard your excellent presentation really thank you in fact as i think there's a the next question is probably for perhaps Sansia or for Sansia to also think about the uh, it's a question from armin von skiller which well, argues that you know, and for as Mitch said, taxing by itself is not really uh, not, not the most important thing. It's what you spend the money on, the tax revenues on. And the point that you know uh, Shanta made at the, at the beginning, which is I thought was an excellent point, of this low-level equilibrium trap, where governments really don't want to tax because they don't want to be held accountable, and citizens want to pay taxes because they feel whatever they pay taxes are not going to be used uh, in a proper way. So. My question then is that how do we get out this low-level low trap, which I think it seems to be in South Africa, even though it still has high tax on GDP, it's not still as high as it could be, and or perhaps even potentially not even going to stay at that level. So how can South Africa get out of what you seem to be suggesting is a low-level equilibrium trap? And then link to the question the Meteor also asked you. Sure. Gunal, I think um, as, as some of the other speakers you know, has, has also emphasized, you know, the devil's always in the details. And in our case, I think our concern, well, obviously on the revenue side, the tax base is a huge concern. And, but on the, you know, the, the bigger concern, I think, is on the expenditure side. And if one, you know, if the tax base were in a position to renegotiate the fiscal contract, if there was sort of a possibility of tax bargaining, I think that would be, it would not so much be the level of tax um, that's being levied, but it would be the way in which it is, is being spent. So um, given the, the, the large imperative to, to spend on, on the social wage, you know, so we still continue to do that in sort of absolute amount. So about 62% of our expenditure still goes towards the social wage, but whatever was supposed to go to towards economic development, to the maintenance and the building of the tax base, that just goes missing. So the infrastructure is crumbled, and that, of course, has undermined the potential um, to, to maintain the, the tax base. 
But then, of course, as far as, you know, the social wage is concerned, we spend a large amount, you know, the largest amount, you know, looking at the functional classification does go towards education, 24.3%. So in, in quantitative terms, a really high percentage, I think, especially in the context of sub-Saharan Africa, a huge percentage is spent on, on our education, but there's a huge quality problem there you know looking at the international tests you know many of our kids are almost functionally illiterate at levels when they were supposed to be reading well and to be you know um, quite uh, quantitatively literate and then of course a large amount goes to our social grants that's also spending uh, rising quite fast but a big problem is that the third largest component on our expenditure side goes towards debt servicing and of course, our public debt stock is rising really fast, uh, given the economic growth that we don't have to service that. So the debt service, debt service cost is definitely a big problem, and especially in the context of our repeated you know, downgrades by rate, rating agencies, given the state-owned enterprises' poor economic performance. Um, and many people say that, you know, given the debt service cost that's rising so fast, we are fast approaching a fiscal cliff, you know. So our debt service cost comes in at 15.8% in the latest budget. Our health budget, which should service 82% of our population, gets only 13.8% of the expenditure, which is, it, which is highly problematic. And apart from that still being in quantitative terms, rather a large amount, um, qualitatively, you know, the healthcare is 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 failing the, the 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 population. So, in terms of quality on the expenditure side, and then of course the rising the debt cost and the fact that what should have gone to infrastructure expenditure just goes through, you know, it's like a leaking bucket on the on the SOE side. Um, so the tax base is not maintained. So mm -hmm. in that regard, it's 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 a problem. So uh, I meant to come back to your your remarks. So I think looking at the expenditure side as a fiscal state, we're definitely underperforming quite badly. Whereas if you look at the you know on the the tax side, we're perhaps not doing that poorly. If one could forget for a moment the fact that much of that's levied through really coercive enforcement and there is increasingly I think pushback from compliant taxpayers you know complaining that they are being bullied by by you know a very very well fanged um, tax administration. Thank you Sancia. Um, it's actually very interesting observations. UNIWAD has a program in South Africa where we talk so have a uh, work stream on taxation. So it's really good for us to sort of think about these issues. I want to ask the last question to the Mete. Mete, this is a question really for you. Um, it's about the optimal fiscal capacity in, in uh, if there was an optimal fiscal capacity. We talked about tax and loans and balancing the two. So is there a kind of optimal balance? Is it like I mean, fifty percent each in which in each or something something uh, or different? So what is it that the what is the balancing here that one needs in, in creating fiscal states between tax and loans, as you argue? And, and also, how does one get there? What kind of policies can one think about to balance this, this two sides of the fiscal capacity story, tax and loans? So over to you. Last question. Okay. Thanks. Yes, <laughs> and, and a very, very difficult one. Uh, so, so because I think and, and and you could also say that this is a weak point in our piece, actually, because what is a balanced relationship between between uh, taxes and loans? We give we gave some illustrative examples here where we talk about Senegal. Senegal is, along with Kenya, one of the uh, the, the countries in Africa that that know how that that tax, uh, you know, reasonably reasonably well. Senegal not as much as Kenya, but still. And, and, and there's a high proportion of personal income taxes as well. Plus there is a so, sort of a sense of a, of a quid pro quo between population and, 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 and state, it seems. Uh, but still it's, it's a pretty low level equilibrium where you know, state services are still uh, lacking and so on. So even if it's a balanced relationship, also it's not a very highly indebted uh, state but even if it's a balanced relationship, it might be at a true, not at an optimal level. <laughs> you know, it might be at a lower level uh, because uh, you know there's still a lack of public expenditure, there's still a lack of income, and so on. So I mean, even if it's balanced, it may not be optimal. Uh, so so I, my my best take would be that that it's very uh, contextual. It's not a very satisfactory answer. <laughs> 
but uh, I think it is very uh, uh, contextual what is optimal given the the particular economy. Um, uh, so that will be the brief answer. And I think for policy recommendations, I, I definitely think there should be more consideration of the tax base and the production that's going on and whether it's taxable or not. Uh, uh, and it seems to me that there's only so far you can get with like technical fixes or digitalizing taxation or whatever if if the type of production is mainly agrarian which is all it also is in 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 senegal um yeah so of course that speaks to what antonio says about rome not being built in one day <laughs> no i absolutely agree in fact uh you know in the public finance literature we talk about optimal tax rate but the view that perhaps we might have, especially with those who are, is the politics of taxation, that there isn't anything called optimal tax rate, optimal fiscal capacity. Because it depends on institutions, history, preconditions, all of this kind of makes it very country specific. So it's not that you can say that 10% or 20% or 25% is the optimal tax of GDP ratios. This would depend very much on exactly economic preconditions, on structural factors, on history, historical factors, institutions. And also the other point I think is important that I think came up very many times here, just taxing by itself is not good enough. How do you, what are you gonna use the taxes for is very important. If you're gonna use it to finance loss making PSUs, that's not the point of taxation. If you're gonna use it for profligate uh, uh, programs which don't really help the poor as Shanta mentioned about countries which are actually of a middle income but have very high poverty rates, that's also not that's also not good enough. So it's not just about raising tax over GDP, but also what you do with the taxes. I think that's important to keep in mind because there's sometimes it's a fetish about just increasing tax over GDP and perhaps not worrying about what the tax is being used for. So I'm going to stop here because we are out of time. I had an excellent discussion, really good uh, presentations, really good questions from the audience and a very large participation from the audience, large, large numbers of uh, colleagues who participated in this uh, in the, uh, among the in the in the audience, and I just want to remind everyone that there is a special issue coming out, the journalist of economics, not too far away, the June issue, uh, which will have all these excellent papers on which we discussed today, mainly by Met and by Antonio, and where we also have a editorial that Antonio wrote, wrote summarizing the key policy messages that have come out of this out of this uh, out of the papers in the special issue. So just a few months away. And uh, hopefully we will all, you'll all get to hear about the special issue when it's published from uh, my colleagues here in, in the communication side of UniWider. And thank you so much for being here in the webinar. Goodbye, everyone. Take care. Bye. Thank you.